Welcome to week four. This is going to be the last week. I, I, there was a mistake on the slide. It says we're going till next week. We're not going till next week. This is the last week, and so uh, hoping to uh, learn a few more things tonight. And um, thought once again we would start off and talk about homework. And so um, why don't like um, why don't the four of you just kind of get together and kind of go through just for a few minutes on, um, you know, okay. what you did and okay. if you didn't, how you're going to hide it from me. Or no. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll pick up in just a few minutes. Did, as you were going through it, did anybody have any thoughts? I don't think you got to this question, but you ever find yourself working harder on somebody else's problems than they are? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Not anymore. Good yes. <laughs> answer. Yes, I have kids. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's easy to fall into it. It's easy to slip into. I want you to change so much because I can see how much better your life would be if you just do this. And yet, you're working harder than they are, and it, it, it usually doesn't work. And you usually get just exhausted, and you just find out it's not going to hold up. So, uh, good job you guys going through and, and keeping up with the homework. Um, I will have homework for the last week, but we're not going to be able to check in on it. So you're just going to have to, that's between you and God on that one. But this week, um, there are a couple of things that I want to talk about. And um, as we get into helping people, have you found that really sometimes you you got to help yourself first before you help other people? like? These lessons that we're talking about, you're like, this is to help me help other people, but I really need to do this on myself first, right? <laughs> and so um, I want to start by talking about the blame game, okay? So are you ready to deny responsibility? Let's play the blame game. So who's to blame? And you can do government, the economy, my mother, my father, religion, science, corporations, media. You can blame a lot of different things. Um, blame started early on in creation. Okay, you think about Adam and Eve, and uh, you know the the serpent convinces Eve to eat the apple, and she convinces Adam, and pretty soon they're blaming each other for you know it wasn't my fault; they made me do it. Nobody wants to take responsibility for anything, right? They're passing on blame. Blame directly opposes being powerful. Okay? If I'm blaming other people, I can't be powerful. It projects out responsibility rather than understanding responsibility starts with me. So if I blame you, I don't have to be responsible. I can say it's 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 all you. I you know, if it wasn't for you, my life would, would be better. All of this, and I'm not taking any responsibility for that. We try, we try to avoid evidence of failure in our lives because we have learned that if we make mistakes, if we make a mistake, we will be punished. And we, we learn that at an early age. And so because we're afraid of making mistakes, because we think if a mistake means we're going to get punished, we'll blame other people for it. We'll blame other things. It's not really my fault. Punish them, not me. It wasn't me. Um, and so we look at people outside of us and assign blame and decide who needs to be punished. We won't take responsibility. When um, I was in undergrad, uh, I was sitting in Spanish class and um, it was one of the advanced classes and we were at a small college and so the advanced classes, there were, there were only like two of us in the class, two of us and the professor. And uh, I was with this guy who was a year or two ahead of me um, in like I might have been a sophomore and he was a junior or senior. And our teacher was talking about uh, the new way of thinking that um, if you leave your money out in your house and your child comes and steals the money, it's actually your fault that they stole it. And I thought, that's ridiculous. <laughs> like it might have been a bad idea to leave the money out, especially if your child can't handle that kind of freedom. 
but it isn't your fault that they stole the money. They, they made that choice. But the funny thing was, the guy who was, was in class with me, he's like, you know, that kind of makes sense. I think it really is their fault. And I thought, there's the problem. <laughs> Assigning blame when you're not owning for yourself what you actually did. Here's the thing. Failure is not fatal. Okay? But John Wooden said that failure to change might be. Failure can actually be a really good thing if you will let it. It's, it's how we learn things. The way we learn to spell is by misspelling a lot of times. The way we learn to do things in school is by making some mistakes. Every check mark on that paper is not saying you're bad, you're horrible. It's saying here's something else you can learn. Here's something more that you didn't know that you can work on to find out more. It's not a bad thing. It's just an indicator to show areas where you can grow. And so if we hide that, if we try to pretend like, well, I actually know all of those questions, it wasn't my fault, I'm actually saying I don't want to grow. I don't want to learn. Um, avoiding failing is avoiding learning. If I completely try to avoid failing and I play it so safe that I never make any mistakes, I'm avoiding learning. And I don't want people to be afraid to fail because, because when they do, they learn. Lives can change because of failure. We actually, um, just this week, we're working with one of our kids, and uh, I won't reveal which one, but they had been giving, uh, doing homework for other kids in their class. Their heart was right. They were like, you know, my friends are busy. They don't have time to do this, so I was going to do it for them. Well, pretty soon I'm getting texts because they think my phone is their phone from friends saying, can you do my homework too? Can you do my homework too? <laughs> and so, you know, eventually we had a talk, and I say, you know, this really needs to stop. Um, I'm going to let your teachers know. And they're like, what? I'm going to let them know. I'm not mad. I just, you know, and, and they had already wanted to stop, but once you start getting requests, it's kind of hard to stop the rush. And um, once I was able to say, I'm not even look. you know, you're getting consequence enough. I don't really have to do a whole lot here. Um, we'll see what the school does, but I really don't think they're going to try this again after this because we had the conversation. They learned. I'm not upset that they learned. I'm actually pretty glad they figured this out now rather than waiting on early, you know, later on in life and cheating on somebody else's taxes for them or something. You know, mm -hmm. let's figure this out now. And I was actually pretty proud of the way that they handled it. And, and now there's, there's no shame attached to it, there's no big deal, but I also am pretty confident it's not going to happen again because they learned a lesson. The idea that there are people who don't fail is a myth, especially in the church. But the thing is, so many times we want to act like we don't fail, we don't have problems, we don't mess up. One of the things I love about Pastor Aaron is he loves to tell you how many times he's messed up. Like he's so transparent, it kind of makes you feel like, oh, I guess it's okay if I mess up too. I don't have to be perfect. It's okay. And, and um, if we're in a culture that perpetuates that and says that we have to be perfect, we can't mess up, we have to hide all of our problems, then we don't get to know each other. And some of us in, in, been in certain situations and you look at people who you, th who you think and, and project this image that they're perfect and what's really happening is they're not letting you get to know them. That's really what's happening. And so think about that in the context of helping people is I don't want to hold anybody to a standard of perfection because if I do, they're never going to be perfect. They're just going to hide themselves from me. My goal is to help people feel comfortable enough that they can let me know the dirt and feel like they're not going to be punished by me. Now, I'm still going to say, you know, what are you going to do? How are you going to clean this up? We're not going to pretend like there isn't a problem if there is. 
you know, if, if you come to me and you, you say you robbed a bank, I'm not going to punish you. <laughs> but that still needs to be taken care of. We still need to do something about that. Um, if we get into a culture where it expects perfection, when failure happens, the message changes from you failed to you are a failure. And we don't ever want people to embrace that, that, that go around thinking that they are a failure. Because they'll, they, they'll give up or, or they'll hide. And shame lures us into hiding. I want you to look at this uh, proverb. This is Proverbs 18.1. A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. When I'm afraid to fail, I tend to isolate myself. I tend to hide. People don't get to know who I am. And when you start isolating yourself, uh, you start acting kind of crazy. <laughs> you start talking to volleyballs. You start doing things. People who are alone for extended periods of time, they kind of snap. And you know, one of the things that I have actually, I, I think I've mentioned before, I drive for Uber and Lyft. One of the things I actually like about that is I get to be around people who don't think like I do all of the time. And, and if I don't feel pressure to have make us agree, it can be a really healthy thing. I will meet people who will never set foot in a church I'm going out and doing that. And it's a really good thing because I want to hear different perspectives. I want to see things in different ways that I wouldn't normally, and, and not feel like I have to think the same way or they have to think like me. I think it's a bad idea to only spend time with people who think exactly the same way that you do. Because then you start thinking crazy thoughts, you start thinking us and them kinds of things. Which is a lot, I think, what we see in, in the political arenas right now is you're either the good guys or the bad guys. It's, you know, it's less and less do you see people crossing political parties and being friends. And, um, and it's just so easy you know, now to isolate yourself. We don't want to do that. We want to you know, be able to see other people for who they are and pu pull out, remove any fear that we have to agree, that you have to be perfect. We want people to, to be able to be who they are. Uh, one of the... Uh, Where am I? Am I on uh, six? Oh no, I haven't gotten that far yet. Five. Five. Um, if your culture says you need to be perfect, you may have people who appear to be perfect, but if you think someone's perfect, you really don't know them. Uh, when um, what you see a lot of times in this is like the, the Facebook culture. You look at somebody's life on Facebook and you're like, oh my gosh, they just they just took this vacation and they're just having this wonderful time. Oh look, you know, little Johnny had straight A's, their kids are better than mine. You know, you're going through th these things. Man, they just have they just have this they're they're act together. Everything's perfect. Well, that's kind of the Facebook snapshot of people. And that's pretty much what you're going to get if that's the only depth that you get to know people. Um, may your life one day be as fabulous as you pretend it is on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I compare my life to your highlights. That's what happens. Shame's goal is to set, set you up to believe you will lose something if you get caught with failure. Maybe you're going to lose your responsibilities. Maybe you're going to lose your position. Maybe you're going to lose trust. And those things could be at risk, but you can't hide and protect those things. You want to, you want to be open let people know who, the, who you are. You want to create a culture uh, around you um, that will allow people to be real. You, when you help people, you want them to feel safe, to be real. Now there's, there's um, when we tend to blame others, we, we want to avoid punishment. I do want to mention there is a difference between punishment and consequences. 
consequences back basically naturally happen because because of decisions you made, things that happen. Okay. So if, if I take um, a wrong turn when I'm driving, the consequence is I might show up late. That's not a punishment. Okay? That's a consequence that happens. And so we're not looking to... Punishment is basically me taking things outside to try to control you. I'm taking things from outside to make you feel worse. And when I try to control you, you'll hide. When punishment comes in, I actually want to hide my flaws. When consequence comes in, it's just that's just... That's just what's happening. It's not me against you. I'm not trying to, to do anything against you. You know, when, when an example with, with one of our kids, um, you know, the consequence was not me punishing them for what they did. They are, you know, there wasn't a punishment to, to let the teacher know. It was just a consequence. The teacher needed to know. It was information they needed to have in the class. And I would have loved to remove that consequence, but that wasn't, you know, that wouldn't have been fair for everybody else involved. It's kind of shocking uh, when blame happens. I remember um, when I was 16 years old, I was working in summer at Cedar Point. And I worked in the hotel, and, which is uh, an eye-opening job when you have high school students and college students cleaning rooms. They don't do the best job all the time. <laughs> um, but at one point, I had stuck my key in a door and turned it funny and I broke the key. I was able to get the end off and I, I brought it back to our maintenance guy and I explained to him you know, what I had done. He's like, you mean somebody else did that, right? And I said, no, I, I broke it. He's like, you're taking the blame? You're actually admitting what you did? I said, yeah, I did it. And it was like he was shocked that I didn't want to blame somebody else because you know, he thought that's what most people would do in a situation. For some reason, I was not afraid of being punished. I just thought, you know, I, I broke a key. Big deal. You know, I know you'll fix it. It'll be fine. Um, failure. First attempt in learning. Fail. I like that. So, the, you know, first attempt in learning. If we look at failure as just a part of the process of learning, and we take the fear out of failing, we're all going to grow a lot faster. The role of failure in learning. <clears throat> where did you go to fail is another way to say where did you go to school. That's 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 how it works. You go to school to find out which places, which ways you, you can uh, learn to grow because you failed in certain spots. I can't when I'm helping people, I cannot be blown away by their failures. In Sozo ministry, we call this the Sozo face. Okay? Basically, whatever shocking thing they tell you, I'm giving them the same face. Like, okay, uh huh, you murdered your sister. All right, all right. You know, I I can't get too shocked at what decisions people have made that I would never make myself. I don't want to portray to them that I'm I'm saying they're they're a horrible person for what they did. Now, I'm still not going to pretend like that wasn't a mistake either. I'm not going to say it's okay that you did that. It's okay that you murdered your sister. No, that is a big mess. That is a big problem. But I also don't want to be like so in shock that I'm acting like I'm above them, that, that, that I can't handle their failures. Don't ever get into the mode of believing that you're somebody's punisher. Jesus didn't come to punish. Don't ever get into that thought. You're not a pun person's punisher because Jesus is not our punisher. You know, to, to look a little bit more even in the, the parenting side, when adults expect children to behave like adults, message is, is sent that you're not allowed to make mistakes. Don't expect kids to be like adults. They're not. You know, don't get mad at their childlikeness. Don't get frustrated because they're still making mistakes. They are going to make mistakes. And you know what? So are we, even as adults. We may not make as many or the same kind, but we're going to make mistakes. And we want to be okay. We want to look at that as, as part of learning. <clears throat> if an adult or a boss or a leader expe expects the people that they are leading to make as few mistakes as possible, it becomes a controlling, fear-based environment. If I'm expecting you to not make any mistakes, then fear is going to rule. Because you're going to be afraid what happens if you do make a mistake. Because you know you're going to. 
even the most perfect, you know, no matter how good you are at, at the job, there are going to be mistakes. Michael Jordan missed some shots. He did. And he learned. And he would, he would look, use it to drive him to get better. Jesus, um, there's, there's this story, because um, we're nobody's punisher, there's this story that, that uh, you probably all know. The woman caught in the act of adultery. And you know it uh, from Scripture, but it's, it's worth repeating, is, you know, this woman's caught in the act, and, you know, of course, the first thing is if she's caught in the act, where's the man? I mean, she was in the act. Where, that, that she wasn't by herself. She was caught in the act. But the, the, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, they come and they say, you know, what the law says, you need to stone her. She deserves death. And um, Jesus, of course, he goes down, he writes something in the sand. We don't really know what he wrote. A lot of people have a lot of good sermons they preached on what he wrote, but nobody really seems to agree on what it was because we don't know. And um, he, uh, he gets up and he says, you know, you're right. Let's punish her. Whoever doesn't have any sin, you go first. And, uh, you know, starting with the oldest guys, they're like, ooh, dang, I guess it's not me. And one by one, they leave, and she's left. But there was one guy there who could have punished her. There was one who actually was sinless, that could have, if he had wanted to, punished her. And, and he looks at her and he says, where are your accusers? And she said, they're gone. They ha and they, 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 won't, they won't punish you. And he said, neither will I. I'm not going to punish you either. Just go and don't sin anymore. And that's a picture of what Jesus does with us. Is he, he wants us to just, just change, just learn, do something different, recognize where... where your mistake is. You don't have to hide your mistake. You just want to learn from it. Grow in it. And she walks away unpunished. And Christians, we need to realize that. That that really is our role. Is Yes, I know we, we really want to say yes. And, and he did say go and sin no more. He did. He did. But he didn't follow her around to make sure she sinned no more either. He just, he just said go and sin no more. I'm not going to judge you. I'm here to help you put your failures to work for your benefit. When I'm helping people, that's my job. It's not to make sure they don't fail. It's to make sure your failures are good investments. Make sure your failures get you somewhere. So there's something... Um, there's something that we do that... Um, to kind of help us grow. That we want to create an environment where it's safe to give feedback. Feedback is something that um, we want to learn how to do, we want to learn how to grow in. Okay? And feedback is actually a way that I can gently point out your failures, along with affirming you. All right? So there's something that we call a hero sandwich. <laughs> And this is especially good if you know your love languages for the words of affirmation people. You, you, it's really good to, to give feedback with a slice of you are amazing, put in the middle a little bit of that you suck at this, but another slice of you're awesome underneath it, and then you give that to them. And so what you basically be doing is, you know, listen, you are such a, a, a gifted speaker. We went a little longer than I would have liked to, but I so appreciate the truths that you brought to us. Okay, you hear that? Mm -hmm. There's a hero sandwich. I'm giving you some feedback, but I want to I want to at least give you double the praise that I gave for that. So I want to take a few minutes. I'd like to practice this. And so here's how we're going to practice it. And there's probably enough to just do two groups. I would like your two groups to come up with a couple of ways I could improve this class. So you're going to give me some feedback, okay? And here's how I want you to think about it. Because too often, especially in our culture, we're so nice. Everybody says, you know, that was just amazing, wonderful job. I have nothing to critique in that. It was perfect. So as good as Jesus could have done it, really? Um, 
what I would like you to ask yourself the question is, if you were solely accountable to God to give me feedback on how I could make this class better, what would he have you tell me? Okay? So break up into a couple of groups. We'll take a few minutes and just share some ideas with each other. And then elect a representative that's going to, uh, to share that. Are you, are you trying to elect a victim? Yes. Yes, we are. All right. Let me, well, let, me ask, um, let me ask you this before we get into it. Was it at all awkward having that discussion for anybody? Did anybody have a hard time? Or just kind of felt like you shouldn't be? No, it's just hard. Good. Good. Be because I like if if I'm too sensitive to criticism, and if I'm not inviting that, and if it feels uncomfortable for you, then I'm doing something wrong. I want to create an atmosphere that it's okay to give you feedback. And I also want to mention this. Feedback is just information for me that's out here. Okay? So just because somebody gives me feedback doesn't mean I have to do it. It's just, it's just feedback. I may disagree with some of the feedback that I get, and that's okay, but I want to create an opportunity for the feedback to be given. And so you're not, I'm, I'm still accountable and in charge of what I do next. So I can't, I don't just change because somebody gave me feedback. They could have had a bad day and thought I should do something way off the wall. Okay? And what's more is if you give feedback and they don't immediately do what the, for you what the feedback was, that is not personal. Okay? Because you are not accountable for what, what the person who's asking for the feedback is going to do. All right? So um, I'm going to take into account all of your, of, of your feedback and, and see where it goes. But more than anything, I would rather just create an atmosphere where we can have these dialogues, where we can have this information going back and forth, and then that's okay. So, uh, who's your who's your elected? All right, Brittany, what do you got for me? Um, so this class is amazing, and we're learning so much. But it's kind of in around dinner time. So if you offer chocolate or some snacks and coffee, that would probably help us stay on task a little bit more. Chocolate, all right. <laughs> and we love being here. <laughs> Great feedback. I wouldn't mind having some snacks myself. Yeah. So we'll do, we'll do that for future classes. Yes, peanut evidence. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Who is your elected? Jesse. I'll say this, this man here did all the work, and so I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to stay humble here. Um, so, Josh, your humility has went a long way. Um, what God has done in you has you know, helped us to see how um, instead of being controlling or trying to help somebody fix something that really bothers us, um, take it off of us, let that load come off of us, and, and how um, you know, you're, you're a, an example of that. Like you're helping people to see their problems in a humble way, um, and you're very soft-spoken at it. And so that it could actually, you know, a solution could be made instead of, you know, you being the hero. So there's humility there, um, and that's awesome. <clears throat> I, we would love to come back um, in a couple months and get, um, I guess, kind of reiterate and see how we've all grown in this. And, um, the slide right here says from 6 to 7 p.m., and um, we think it's more like 6 to 8. So. <laughs> Sorry, that was two pieces of in the middle. But um, <clears throat> you're giving very valuable information and um, helping us to engage. Uh, and, yeah, it's changing our lives. Oh, okay. There will be a, a great and lasting impact. Wow. Thank you. So those were excellent hero sandwiches. Mm -hmm. Like everything in them, even the middle tasted good. Mm -hmm. So, and but I also want to say like, and you guys are, are all very kind and gentle too. If you have some stronger feedback, I'm okay with that too. If, if, if something comes up, I just ask that you would be okay with me not heeding that feedback. 
said where to come We had on. another one, mm -hmm. and it was on the wording on our sheet and the way that you're speaking, which is good, but we don't always get the answers to our questions, and sometimes that's distracting because we're like, hey, what would you get? Okay. So I didn't put that in a hero sandwich. I'm sorry for the delivery. <laughs> Can you tell me something? Is it better, in, in your opinion, is it better to fill in the blanks or just have it all in front of you? I think writing it down does help us mm -hmm. yeah. okay. kind of reiterate what we're learning. So okay. I think filling in the so blanks. I just need to pick and choose better what blanks to fill in and, and make sure that I hit those. Or you could put a slide up. With, okay. Yeah, yeah that that's would be good. good. Then we wouldn't have to solve you and you could continue flowing. Good feedback. Yeah, no. You see how that flows, though? Like, once we start doing it, nobody feels bad. That's, like, really good information for me. And I will probably make some changes the next time I do one of these classes that, that that's actually going to help the next group of people uh, do better. Do you, have, do you have a question, Pam? No, I just want to say at the end of a hero sandwich oh. that um, you're not, like, lecturing at us and it's interactive and we can't ask questions. So uh, I really like that. It's not like your book that, you know, if we have a question or, you know, it's interactive, I like that. Thank you. Yeah, that is part of my goal is to try to keep this interactive for a few reasons. One is I think you'll remember it better yeah. if we're interacting and it's, it's not as distracting. But the other thing is I like to give opportunities for people to talk together with each other and kind of get to know each other a little bit and, and that kind of thing. So thank you. Thank you. Very good feedback. All right. So as I get feedback, as I do any of this stuff, I want you guys to realize that excellence is my goal, but not perfection. I want to do this excellent, but there's always another layer that we can get to. There's always something better. And what's excellent today may change in five years. You know, the way we present this could be very different in the future. So I want to constantly be growing. What happens a lot of times, and, and it's not just in the church, it's just humans in general, we get this idea that if we can just get to the finish line, everything will be great. And that's not how life works. Life is a garden. You weed it, and then you, go, you have to go back and weed it again. We're constantly growing. We're constantly doing something else new. And so, so we have to get this, this out of our head that we're going to arrive at some point. No, we're just always keeping, continually trying to grow. We're always trying to, to just get a little better, do a little bit more, without the uh, shame or burden when we fall short. We're just trying to see what's the next step. Here's a little quote about blame. <coughs> when you blame others, you give up your power to change. Think about that. If I'm blaming somebody else, I put the power to change in them. Well, you know, I'd, I'd have a better life if it wasn't for you. Well, then I guess I can't do anything about my life because you're there. Or I can do something about this. I can change. Even if you're, if you're around, there are choices that I can make to improve my life, to make things better. You hear people say things like, um, until you change the way that you talk, I won't stop being disrespectful. You talk to me like that, I'm going to talk to you like this. No. I'm an honoring, respectful person. I choose how I talk to you, regardless of how you talk to me. And when I don't, I own it. Like, you know, I, you're right, I was disrespectful. You were too, but that doesn't excuse me for how I acted. Okay, so... That's something that I'm working on. I'm not going to blame you for my disrespect. I'm an honoring, respectful human being. That's who I am. You don't control that regardless of how you treat me. I may put up a, a boundary around that and say, I also control, decide who I'm going to listen to, who I'm going to spend time with. And I don't enjoy having cobras in my house. So I'm going to set that boundary and keep me. <clears throat> I can manage myself, whether you lie, whether you tell the truth, whether you love me, whether you reject me, I'm going to manage me. 
Blaming you for how I treat you is a sedu seduction of blame. That's, that's, it's so seductive to say, well, you were, you were bad, so that's why I'm bad. That's not a good excuse. Um, if I need to avoid punishment and hide my life, I believe I am evil because of my mistakes. If I make a mistake, then I just assume I'm, I'm evil because I deserve punishment. I don't want to live that way. Your brain is a muscle, and mistakes are like with lifting weight. Okay? When I help people, I'm working to help them use mistakes to grow. Growth areas were there before the mistakes happened. So, you know, if, if I take a spelling test, and I misspell Mississippi, and they put a check mark by it, if I just avoid taking that test, I don't learn how to spell Mississippi. I just, I just don't get the information that I don't know how to do this yet. Okay? So I don't want to avoid this. You see how Jesus deals with his disciples. When he's with them, it's like a comedy show. <clears throat> I mean, these guys are tripping over each other. Like, you know, I, I, oh, I cut somebody's ear off, you know? Or I'm arguing about who's the greatest. Can you just tell me that I'm the greatest? And Jesus, he never punishes them for that. They're, they're, they're you know, just being this, this mess, never punishes them, but he does affirm. He's like, you've got a right desire there, but, but the way you're going about it is all wrong. If you want to be great, let me show you what a child's like. Here's what a child's like. Here's, here's what the faith of, of, a, of a child's like. Um, if you want to be great, just be a servant. Serve other people. And so he, tried, he, he, he shows them that your desires are good, Maybe you're going about it the wrong way, but he's never like, you know, you guys, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna smite you. What are you talking about? Who's the greatest? I mean, come on. You know, he doesn't. He's very patient with them because he sees that the mistakes are learning, and it, and you look at them, and they grew because they made mistakes. They learned. I want people to think that they're supposed to be great. And I want to help that, them with that because I want to think that they're supposed to be great. I want to look at them and think, the mistake doesn't define you. Actually, the mistake is just information to help you get closer to your greatness. That place where you messed up, let's figure out what needs to happen there. Let's figure out what the key is so that we can get a step closer to what God made you to be. Now we, what, now we see where, where the symptom is. Now we see where the problem Let's deal with it now. Let's put failure to work for our long-term benefit. Let's actually make it do something for us. And so that's where we come back to the things, you know, what, that we learned in week one. What are you going to do? Those are questions I want to keep asking them. I'm not going to go to them and say, You're, how horrible was that? I can't believe you just did that. You're just, you just need to be punished. Now I'm going to say, what are you going to do? And then after that, I might even say, what did you learn from that? You know, what, what did you figure out because you just made that mistake? What was the problem? When Adam and Eve failed, God didn't just wipe things clean. He didn't just say, well, I guess we'll just make a new race of people or do something else. He actually, we get to keep cleaning up our mistakes. We get to keep going back and figuring it out again and going around. There's a... Um, I have mentioned uh, that I got uh, a life coach who, unfortunately, passed this last summer, uh, died unexpectedly. But as he was working with me, he's a great example of somebody who learned to use his mistakes to grow. He was um, kind of in his community. He was kind of known as the guy that the churches would send people to when when the. Uh, they were struggling in their marriages, or they were struggling and needed some help, support, counseling, that kind of thing. Was doing very well, had a great reputation, and wound up having an affair on his wife. And you can imagine it just blew up the community because this was the guy that everybody went to to help them with those kinds of problems. Now he's having this problem himself. And um, and you know when I started coaching, like he's completely open. This is what I did. This is what happened, and this is how we worked through it. And so he got into a, a counselor himself because you know 
He was broken, and it was there. It was glaringly obvious. And his wife came with him. And um, at first, he wanted to just say how horrible he was and, and you know, what, what he did. And, and the counselor's like, you're right. Why would you do that? And he's like, well, you, I don't want to say it in front of her. Do you want to work on this or not? He said, well, I, I felt lonely. I was not getting attention from her. I, I, I wanted attention. I didn't get it. And they begin this wonderful dialogue back and forth. And God um, shows, and then he said, and then the counselor said, okay, that's why you did it. Why would you make that choice, though? Like, like you were lonely, but you don't, that's not an excuse. You can't use lonely as an excuse for the, the choice you made. But then they went back to, to the wife, and she, she said, you know what, God just showed me that I was neglecting him. I was no better. I was no better. And the two of them, because they used that mistake to heal and grow, they were stronger than they ever were before. They, they used that mistake, and they turned it into something amazing. So when we say God works together, you, you know, uses all things, you know, uh, Yes, all things work together for the good of those who love God. That's what that looks like. Now, God doesn't intend all things to happen, but He will use anything. You can be dealt a pair of twos, and, and, and He'll make it into something amazing. And so, if, if we will give Him our mistakes, He will turn it into something great. So that's blame. The next thing I want to talk about this evening, I want to talk about making sure you're not driving on empty. If you're helping people any amount of time, there's a temptation to drive yourself into burnout. How do I know? Because I've been there. <laughs> I, I know what it feels like. And um, self-care is, is just a key to helping you be able to continue to help people and do it well. If you don't have time to take care of yourself, it's like basically saying, I don't have time to fill the gas tank in my car while I'm driving. It's not going to keep running long. You're not going to be able to keep doing what you're doing if you continue to run on empty. And so you need to think about things. What kind of things nourish you? What kind of things replenish you? How do you make sure that, that you're getting what you need? Because if you're helping people much at all, there are going to be some things that drain you. I've had close friends that have had affairs. I've had very close friends that have had domestic violence issues. I've had you know, friends come to me if their kids have been abused. Um, you know, one of my friends uh, a, a couple of years ago uh, came to me just desperate because he had uh, had an affair on his wife. <coughs> she found out thing was, a couple of years before, she had an affair on him and brought it to him and talked about it. And it, it's just, as, you're, as you get closer to people and they, they make choices that blow up their lives, you have all this wisdom to give them and they don't follow it, if you're not careful, you're going to burn yourself out. You're going to keep so many things on you that you won't be able to ha handle this. So you've got to take some time to think about what kind of things will nourish you. What kind of things will, will allow you to maintain this? Because if you don't think about that, nobody else is going to. People will take and take and take, and you will run on empty. And pretty soon, you're going to be the one that's in the same situation that the people are coming to you needing help are in. <clears throat> we can't give away what we don't have. And so if I don't have this in me, if I don't have health and, and, and goodness in me, it's going to be hard. I can't really give that to other people. Now, don't get me wrong. I've seen unhealthy people do amazing things in ministry. I have. I've seen the Holy Spirit somehow flow out of a sewer pipe. I mean, I don't know how it works. But they've still blown up their life. They've still blown up their life. It does not illegitimize you know, the, the, the ministry and what they did for other people. But it does actually make, it makes a mess. 
because you get a, a combination of, of truth and wisdom and move of the Holy Spirit with a, with a big pile of manure. And you don't know what to do with it. it it'll harm and confuse a lot of people. Lives need to be planted, watered, and weeded. So we need to plant new things. We need to nourish that. We need to pull out the weeds of things that we don't want in our lives. How do we nourish and protect what is going on in our lives? So just to ask you know, the group uh, tonight, what are some things that you like to do to relax? Just say it out loud. What are, what are the things that you do to, what are some ways that you, um, you like to rest? Watch fishing videos. Fishing videos, all right. I have not heard that one before, but yeah, good, good. Anybody? Hiding. What? Hiding. Yes. Hiding? Hiking. Oh, hiking. <laughs> Hiding's good, too. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, when I was uh, when my kids were younger, we we play hide and go sleep. Okay. They hide and I go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? What what kind of things do you like to do to to rest? Get outside and breathe. Yeah. Yeah. What do you like to read? Anything? I like novels. Okay. So it it's not anything like super Story. intense. It no. just kind of take you to another place yeah. and. Good historical fiction. Good stories. Yeah. Yeah. Praying. Praying. All right. Good. Good. I like to do nothing. Like sit on my couch with my dog. Yeah. And turn the fake fireplace on my TV and just sit there. Yeah. <laughs> That's my love language. Wow. My husband's always like, "Why? What are you doing?" And I'm like, "Nothing. I'm doing absolutely nothing." But if that recharges you, you know, that's that's great. That's great. Well, I want you to. Um, there are basically three R's of rest. Okay. So you got relaxational, relational, and recreational. Okay? And all three of these are really important. Um, one of the things that, like Aaron and Nicole have established in this church, that they're really good at is the relational piece. Like they, you know, it's just, they're just fun to hang out with. They're just fun to spend time with. They've always got something goofy that they're doing, you know, something fun, really light. I've never, um, I, I have more fun going on a ministry trip with Aaron than going on vacation. Like it's, I mean, that's how much fun it is. It's just, he, he just finds something else to do. We're walking out of Mexico with huge cups full of uh, coconut milkshakes and, and, you know, just playing in the swimming pool and doing ministry too, you know? But it's, it's like, it is just so refreshing. But then the, the uh, recreational, that, those are like the big vacations, you know? Maybe you go out, maybe you want to try water skiing or something, and, and you do that. The thing is, though, with, with, with those things, too, you ever go on this amazing vacation, and, and it's like, it really is, and it fills something. But you come home, and you realize, I'm tired, <laughs> right? Because yes. it's only feeding one aspect of rest, right? Because, you know, so uh, relaxational is really important. Sometimes we get so caught up in saying, well, i got to rest, so I'm going to go on a vacation. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go see this. I'm going to do this, which is great. But don't forget about the, relax the relaxational, which is sitting in the chair staring at the, the video of, of a fireplace and doing nothing, which is great. You, know? you want to feed all three of those. You want to think about all three of those in any areas uh, that, that might uh, be fed in. So, you know, sometimes it's, it's sleeping in a little bit. It's, it's like actually recognizing, i got a lot of stuff to do, but if I don't sleep in, it's going to be worse. And so some of those two, you can feed two or three of those at one activity. Like you can do recre recreational and relational together quite a bit. You know, you take people with you that you enjoy, and you go to the amusement park, right? Are you building a life you want to live in, or are you reacting to the demands of the people around you? What do you want to live in? What kind of life do you want to have? What are you, what are you building? Because it's so easy, because there's no shortage of demands around you. There's no shortage. People will pull you in a thousand different directions, and many of them will be offended that you didn't go in the direction that they were pulling. 
you've got to practice what you preach. So if I'm preaching health, I need to work on being healthy. And if I'm not being healthy, I don't want to admit it. Mm -hmm. Okay? It, it's, it's the weirdest thing, you know, thinking of practicing what you preach. When I was um, working in a children's home, we had several nurses who worked there. And it would shock me that these are nurses, and every single one of them would have to have a smoke break. I'm thinking, you're a nurse. You know health. Like, like you don't have an excuse here. You're not practicing what you preach. But it was always confusing to me that I thought, if anybody would not want to do a smoke break, it'd be a nurse. But it seemed to happen all the time. And it, th this has almost become cliche, but you know the oxygen mask example. <laughs> you know, th if you've ever been on an airplane, it doesn't take long for you to hear this, is if in the event of an emergency, when the oxygen masks drop, make sure you take care of yourself before you help, help anybody around you. Well, that's just mean. Mm -hmm. what, if, what about these little kids? Well, you're not going to be much help to them if you're passed out. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so it's, it's the same principle. You know, if, if um, there, there really is no end to the demands that can be put on your life. There's no end. And this is why it's critical to have a, a series of priorities to building a life you actually want to live in. What are you going after that you actually want to live in? If you are burning yourself out so much trying to get people saved, it's going to be hard for them to understand what they're getting saved into. Mm -hmm. If you have no energy because you're, you're constantly out, even Jesus knew how to rest. He knew how to take a break. And pretty soon, if all you do is you help people and, and you don't take any time to recharge yourself, you start to get cynical. You start to get irritated with people. You start telling negative stories to your friends about them and gossiping and slandering. And you get tired of helping people, but you keep doing because you feel like you have to. You've got to take time for yourself. You've got to make sure you're caring for yourself. So let me get this right. You got the new iPhone and your fridge is empty. Priorities. Priorities. Protect your priorities, your time, your energy, your resources, your relationships. Okay? I do not want Angie or my kids to feel like ministry is more important than they are. If I do that, something is way out of whack. Something is, is, is really confused. Nobody will manage your time if you don't. Nobody else is waiting to say, oh, here, let me take this so you can manage your own time, and I'll just manage it for you to make sure you've got plenty of time to rest. You have to be the one to manage it. Nobody else is going to do that. And if you don't recharge your body, or your money, or your marriage, or your family, nobody else will. If you don't pay attention to that, nobody's jumping in to take care of that for you. And then you'll just, um, you'll just make excuses for your life. You'll go back to that blame game. Well, if I didn't have so many things to do, I'd be able to take better care of my kids. <clears throat> well, that was your choice. You chose to do that. And then, or you, you hope that somebody else will put boundaries around you instead of you setting up boundaries for yourself. And once in a while that'll work, but you can't maintain that very long because pretty soon they'll see, you're, I'm working harder on this than you are. I can't do this for you either. So get good at letting others know what you are willing to do and under what conditions. When people want to meet with me, I will say these are the times I have. When they come back to me and they say I can't do any of those times, I will bump them further out. Um, depending on it. Now if Angie needs time, she gets it, right? Because that's the closer in my circle. The closest in my circle gets more of my time. But I wouldn't sacrifice time with her so I could be with somebody else who's way on the outside because it wasn't convenient for them. I'm not stepping out of my convenience because they're not willing to or, or not able to. And if we just get to the point where we realize our times aren't going to work, you may need to go to somebody else to help you. Um, because I can't make it a bigger priority. <clears throat> you manage yourself in the presence of the demands of others. I'll be glad to meet with you after you do this. Have you read the chapter that I had suggested? When that's done, let me know and then we can meet again.
you know, set those kinds of, of, of boundaries to make sure that, that people are uh, keeping the, you're, you're protecting your priorities. I will take, um, I think I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago, might have been even week one. Um, I, uh, one of my, my kids uh, came home, they were getting ready to go to practice, and they said, um, I told them, the dishes need done. I said, I don't have time, I gotta get ready for practice. Now I knew there was plenty of time. It had like an hour, all they had to do was change into some clothes. And uh, um, so I waited. And they came back down, and it was time for them to go to practice. They said, all right, I'm ready to go. And I said, we'll go as soon as the dishes are done. And they said, well, wait, why didn't you tell me before? I did tell you before. You said you were too busy. So now that it's time to go, maybe you're not too busy to do it. But that's not fair. Well, would you like to talk about that some more now and use some more time to do that? Or would you like to get the dishes done so we can leave? And they go do the dishes. Okay? I am not trying to control them. I'm telling them what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave when the dishes are done. If you don't want to do the dishes, you can find another way to get to practice, or you cannot go to practice, or maybe you've got some other creative solution for this. I don't know. I'm telling you what I'm going to do. Then you can figure out what you need to do. I'm not going to do this for you. I'm not running in to, to rescue you from your dishes. I told you they needed done, and I knew you had enough time to do them. <clears throat> I will manage what I can control. I do require high levels of respect and responsibility from those people that I help. If you don't do that, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go out of my way to help you. Right? Um, but I also require it from myself. I expect to be respectful and self-controlling around you, too. <clears throat> I don't participate in disrespectful or irresponsible relationships, irresponsible treatment of me. I'm not going to be a part of that. I will be happy to discuss with you how you're upset with me as long as you keep it respectful. I'm not perfect. Maybe I did something that hurt or offended you. You can bring that up with me. I'm not saying don't tell me what issue you have with me. I'm saying bring it to me respectfully. And I'll be happy to hear that. Don't think that I have to agree with it, but I do expect myself to at least listen and understand it. Um, and, I, you know, it's up to me. I get to decide how many disrespectful conversations I participate in. That's my choice. If my limit is two and, I've, I, and it's the third one today, sorry, I'm not participating in this one today. I really prefer to keep it at zero, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are you avoiding burnout or executing a vision? These are the things, this is a nice little thing, th uh, things that you can control. What I think about myself, how I treat other people, how I react to things, my choices. Things outside of that you don't control, okay? How, pe how people treat each other, things people do say. I'll go back, how the kids treat each other, how your children act around each other, you do not control that. <laughs> what people think about me, I don't control that. My circumstances. I, I only have so much say of what I can do about my circumstances. But if the car broke down, I can control whether it gets fixed or not. But I don't control whether it's broke down. It is broke down. Now how am I going to respond? Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so one of the questions that you want to think about is, um, are you avoiding burnout or pursuing a vision? Why did you get up this morning? Did you have something that you're working toward? Or something that, that you were wanting to see in your life? Because if you're simply trying to avoid burnout, you're probably going to get to burnout. If your goal is to not burn out, you've already got a problem. Okay? If you have a vision, you're a lot more likely to create tomorrow you want to live in instead of avoiding burnout. You need to think about things like exercise, nutrition, rest, okay, for you. Not because that's the checklist of things that make you know a good human being, a, a good Christian. But those things are actually to help fuel you. You need those things. 
it's, it's kind of um, like what we talked about last time is, are you going to change because of pain or vision? Change is coming. Change happens in life. But if you, if you do not plan for it, it's going to change. you're going to change because of a lot of pain in your life. Or you can say, I'm going after this. Now, pain may still come because that's life. That's part of it. But pursuing a vision will actually help you get past that pain. And um, you want to get past thinking about what is in my immediate best interest and get on to what am I going after? Who am I? What am I created to be? You know, immediate best interests can change day to day. You know, I'd feel better if I had an ice cream. True, but I did want to train for the Olympics. So that's going to be hard if I keep making choices like that. Okay. Think about what are the meditations of your heart. Psalm 19.14 Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength, my redeemer. <clears throat> Pay attention to what you think about. Are you thinking negative thoughts? I can't tell you how many times, like, I'm, I'm very sensitive to what's going on in the room. I'm very sensitive to, to what people are doing around me. And I'm constantly thinking, and, and it's weird like this, I'm always thinking they're thinking negative things about me. Right? And so, well, they probably didn't like how I said that one, or they probably, you know, think that I'm, I'm, I'm pump blowing smoke, or they're probably thinking this. I have to, to grab on and say, say, now come on, what really is the truth? What, what is really happening? What's really going on? I want to meditate on good things. And so whatever that is, I want to confront that and then say, all right, even if they are God, what do you think of me? And they're probably not. You're probably not that important to them, actually. <laughs> they probably don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about you. Um, what, are you what, what kind of things are you stuck on? Are you stuck in Facebook? Now, if Facebook is your relaxation time, that's great. If Facebook becomes your life, that's a problem. You know, um, there are a lot of things, recreation is a good thing if it's your rest. It's not necessarily a good thing if it, if it replaces life. Okay? It's, it's, it's like, you know, if you get so into recreation that that's all you care about and think about, the purpose has been removed from it. It's not rest anymore. It's actually blocking you from living life. What kind of things you think about? You spend a lot of time thinking about politics. Good luck with that. <laughs> That's not a great meditation on my heart. Okay? You know, maybe if you have good goals for politics, if you're thinking what are good things that can change. But if you're you know, if you're digging in the negative side of politics, there's just too much of that. Um, <clears throat> theology. Theology can be a great thing if you if you're, you know, confident and pressing into God. It can be a terrible thing if you're thinking about how wrong other people are all the time. <laughs> or if you're always worried about you being wrong. You know, theology is a good thing, but you don't want to meditate on it to the point where, where it becomes a, a, a dread. Coronavirus. <laughs> people think about that a lot. That's a big conversation. Big thing to worry about. Uh, you know, there are... Even now, and I know what they're saying, it's going to turn into this big thing and, and that kind of thing. And maybe it is bigger, but I don't see what me worrying about it is going to help. Because at this point, the number of people who have actually died from it is still pretty small. When, when you see the whole scheme of things, other things that could happen to people, other ways that people die, it's just another thing that we can sit and be scared about. At one point it was mad cow. You know, at one point, uh, you know, well, name your disease, you know, there bird flu and, and all these other kinds of things. So many different ones. Um, swine flu, yes, I forgot about that one. But so many different things that we just, we, we would get scared of and then they just kind of pass on and we'll find something else to be afraid of. I don't want to meditate on those things. If I'm thinking about it, I'm going to think about, God, what kind of amazing victory are you going to bring in this? How are you going to show yourself to be, be God and be true in this? So can you cultivate peace and power and meditate on a vision that brings peace? What brings you peace and what brings you anxiety? 
you've got to watch the meditations of your heart. Are your relationships clean? Are there people that you need to forgive in your life? If so, do it. Do it. Forgiveness is for you. It releases you from that dread. It's not for them. If they don't deserve it, forgive them. That's what Jesus did. When anxiety comes, it causes so much chaos, and it's because of meditating on, on other things. Judgment, strife, unforgiveness, all killers. Apologize if you need to. If you have something that you realize you did, go to the people and apologize. Just this, this uh, past few weeks, it's been wonderful that I could confront people on things, on some different things, without the pressure that we have to agree and recognizing it doesn't threaten our relationship. Like we can actually disagree and we actually felt closer in, in times when we've had disagreement because we're like, oh, that doesn't mean that we can't be friends. This is great. We don't see it the same way. We still like each other. How amazing is that? That's better than seeing it the same way. It's free. Do you have a steady diet of laughter and joy in your life? I will search YouTube videos, some of them I'll share on, you, on here to make you guys laugh because I just want to have a few things that I can just chuckle about, you know? Um, what do you enjoy? How much of it do you, have you done this week? It won't be something that happens if you don't plan for it to happen. It's not just waiting for, for you to, to, to have this joy in your life. If you, as, you, as you're pouring your life out, you need to make sure you refill. Is God near you, or is he lost in your turmoil? He never left. Pastor Greg said, I don't know if he said it in the second service, I know he started the first service with it, because there's this older couple driving in the car, and the, the woman says to the, the husband, they're, they're driving along, and they see all these couples driving in other cars, young couples, and they're just sitting really close together, his arms around her, and the woman's like, Wow, look how close. We used to sit close like that. And they see another one. Hey, look at those. We sat like them, them too. Why don't we do that anymore? And the man finally says, I haven't moved. I'm still in the same spot. And that's what, that's, that's what um, Jesus is basically saying. He hasn't moved. If we're not feeling close, we've scooted away somehow. We need to scoot back over. Cultivate... Um, a life and vision that inspires others. Get some things going on in your life that people will want to look at and say, yeah, I want that in my life too. And if you don't realize that you've already got some of those things going on, ask some people around you. You already do. Every one of you in here actually has a life that there are people around you that you don't even know that would die for. They, they, they wish they had the life that you have. They wish they had it. It's easy to talk about living uh, living the way you want to and being healthy. It's a whole other thing to actually do it. Like I have to be very intentional to try to stay healthy. It's been a challenge for me to learn how to do this rest thing. I'm not always good at it. You know, I God actually had me start working on doing Sabbath, and I'm not even good at doing that. I, I really struggle at doing that. But it has caused me to, to grow, and it's caused me to, to say, you know what, I really actually needed that. And I'd fight against it, and I'd come back every week, and I'd still, I'd still have to learn how to do it. So I want you to just pursue great lives. And it has to be your definition of great. What do you want your life to be? Not what you see other people doing. Not what you think you, you should do that would look good in other people. What would be great for you? Because if, you, if you're going to uh, bring hurting people to hope, if you're going to help them hope, you've got to have some things that, that are going that you're, you're happy about, that you're excited for in your life. Build a life that you want to live and teach other people to, to do the same. Whatever section that you do in life. It doesn't have to be what other people are doing. There are things that everybody in here is doing that could improve other people's lives. And so think about areas in your life 
that needs some time and attention, and then ask yourself the question that we started in week one, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I want to, uh, did everybody get the, uh, the recommended resources page? I want to go over that uh, before we wrap up. I want to just mention some of these resources. Because I, I recognize, you know, probably not everybody's going to go out and use every single one of these. So I'm going to highlight some, and, and you can decide if you're going to use any of them or, or what you'd like to do with them. <clears throat> Coaching questions uh, by Tony Stoltzfus is like 101 good questions. And so just good questions to get people thinking, help them solve their own problems, and not you run in and rescue it rescue them from it. So if you're, if you're always the one who, who tries to tell people how to fix their own problems, this is a good one for you to, to, to get to try to help people figure out how to solve their own problems. The Lost Art of Listening. In week one we talked about how often it is that I'm already thinking about what I'm going to say before while you're talking to me instead of actually listening to what you're saying. This book is really good um, at just kind of cutting down to, to the core of learning how to listen to people so that they feel loved, so that they feel empowered. Um, that is, it is not a Christian book, but there's nothing in it that I feel like contradicts anything in Scripture. So if you only read Christian books, you know, uh, there's grace for you. But, uh -huh. <laughs> but, um, but it's really good that. Ending Our Love Affair with, with Punishment, uh, Danny Silk, Unpunishable. That's his most recent book. Very good, very good about that. And it actually starts the book with some theology behind it. And so if you need some theology to, to see that, that I believe that um, Jesus took our sin and punishment. He took punishment on him. And that either worked or it didn't. So if it worked, there's no more punishment to pour out on us. I mean, there are consequences, but there's no more punishment. But this book will even go into, even from the beginning, what we have interpreted as punishment wasn't what we think of. Biblical punishment is more God withdrawing his hand and allowing you to go into what you, where you were already starting to go. Okay. Um, Healthy Boundaries, the Boundaries book uh, by Henry Cloud, that's been out for a while. Um, but that's, that's a really good one. Connection. Um, Increasing connection, decreasing fear in relationships, keep your love on. Um, that's been out for a little while. Inner Healing, the, the Sozo book by Donna Da Silva, that is basically goes through the Sozo technique that we use here at the church. Um, but it, it, it's some, for me, it's nice to have, they've got actual stories of, of things that they've used and kind of gives the details of it. And I think we still have that one in the bookstore. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Optimism, attitude, and renewing the mind. Um, it's getting better all the time. This is a little, that's a secular book. It's a little dated. It's, I think it came out in about 2000, so about 20 years old. But what it actually showed shows is in about every way that we can measure it, society's actually getting better. All the bad news we hear, everything everybody says is getting worse. There are fewer diseases, the standard of living is better, even moral choices people are making is actually better. It's a veil that the enemy puts over us, I believe, that make us think that things are getting worse to focus on the negative. So this book will scare you positive. It will it will make you think, oh my gosh, you know, I would I would rather look at that than look at the news. Because the news is going to show you the bad things that are happening. But in about every area, the world, not just our country, the world is actually improving in about every area. Doesn't mean that there aren't challenges. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't, you know, we should ignore problems. But it, it helps be optimistic. Then uh, victorious emotions and victorious mindsets. Wendy Backlund and Steve Backlund. That is just to kind of help you get to thinking the way that God would think about you. And so, like one of Wendy's quotes is, God told her instead of saying, "What would Jesus do?" Think, say, "How would Jesus think?" Because he would see situations complete, not just what he would do, but how would he think about this? And um, it's really helpful to uh, to kind of just renew your mind. 
That one's a pretty easy read. Too. Yes, very short. Very yeah, and so it's easy if you're time constricted. Yes. Like I used to read a chapter and I was like two, three minutes. It wasn't very long. Yeah, very short, very easy read. Um, pain, we talked about pain some last week. The problem of pain, C.S. Lewis, that's a classic, but it's he's really good at breaking down what pain is about. And, and, and that. Um, poverty, middle class, and wealth mindsets. Um, Ruby Payne's book, The Framework for Understanding Poverty, and there's, she's also got one called Bridges Out of Poverty. One's more clinical than the other. That is a secular book, but it's really good at breaking down what the poverty mindset is like, what the challenges are, and it gives you hope for how to, how to work on that with people and how to change it. And then The Supernatural Ways of Royalty, Chris Valentin, um, that takes, that's a, a Christian book, takes more of a Holy Spirit mindset that's basically saying, we are not trash. If I point to, a, you know, in, in a lot of times, classically in the church, we would say, you know, I'm nothing, I'm worthless, Jesus is so great, but I'm nothing. But if I told the artist that his painting was, was trash and no good, it would not be a compliment to the artist. We are his art. We're not saying that we're him. We're not saying that we're completely perfect. But it's a really good one to shift mindsets of we actually have a place in here and we're valuable. We are valuable in him. Um, the um, Invitation by Tony Stoltzfus, that is a really good one. When we did the uh, Desire Wheel, that's in there. Um, how the Lord will meet our desires and how sometimes we distract ourselves from those desires by trying to meet them in unhealthy ways. Um, vision, mission, purpose. Uh, these are both secular books, but they're good. Uh, good they're, they're kind of business books because business is always good about uh, getting that. But start with why. One of the things that we find is people tend to start with what and how. So, you know, I want to be the greatest tennis player in the world, so I'm going to practice tennis. But if I don't know why, I'm probably going to burn out. If I know why, I'll go into it and say, because I, you know, maybe it's because um, I want to create a platform for Jesus. Or maybe it's because, you know, a, a lot of different things. He compares, in the book, he compares um, Apple and Microsoft. Apple's vision is to make technology easier and more useful for everyone in the world. Very concise, very great why. This is why we do it. Microsoft was beat Apple. <laughs> so who measures that? How do you know when it's done? What keeps you going? What if you do beat Apple? Then you're done? You know, just so, so many questions like that. Um, Good to Great is a, another good one. They look at different companies and, and some of the most successful companies and why did they become successful. And then vul Vulnerability and Self-Love, um, The Gifts of Imperfection, Brene Brown, just about anything by Brene Brown is vulnerability. Um, some of her stuff, um, she, she is a Christian, but she's on a little on the more liberal side of Christianity. Some of her stuff is a little bit closer to Oprah, um, but she's got a lot of good stuff in there as well. Um, and then there's some online classes. I mentioned Danny Silk's Life Academy. You can get it on that at lifeacademy.com. Things that relate to this, the People Helping People courses, is, that's what this class was built off of. And so I threw some other things in it, kind of scrambled around a little bit, but you'll get that. You can get it from Danny Silk on that course. Relationships 101 is a good one, and then Successful Confrontation is another good one. Um, and then Sozo Ministry. If you want to get your own Sozo Ministry, we do them right here. And that's, the, that's where you can register for that. All right. Well, let me, um, let me go ahead and give out our week four homework. I know there are more than enough here. Any comments, questions, or thoughts on anything? On the video, you're going to just post it online. Like, I know you posted it online. I know Pam said she didn't do Facebook or whatever. Okay. It's on YouTube. It's on YouTube. It is on YouTube. The link is on the Facebook page, but it's on YouTube. But when you click on it, it takes you to YouTube. It takes you to YouTube, okay. yeah. Now, the, the handouts are on our Facebook page okay. as well. Um, and so if somebody doesn't do Facebook and they want the handout, I can get the, But I have the extra handouts here, okay. too.
But yes, um, the church has our own YouTube page. And so we aren't the only upper room. So you may have to search a little bit to find it on YouTube. But the link on Facebook will take you there. Okay. And if, if you want me to send you the link um, to the church's uh, YouTube page, let me know and I can, I can do that too pretty easily. So my challenge for you is to, to begin to walk this out. Um, don't try to do everything at once. Pick some things that spoke to you. Pick some things that you feel like you can use and begin walking those out. And then um, look at the uh, recommended resources and see if there's anything there that, that you're feeling a little bit of tug on and say, well, I'll, I'll check out that one and see where that one might go. Um, before I close, are there any particular things that you found most useful, whether it's techniques, information, things, anything that you found useful that you were either able to practice or you feel like I didn't think about it that way? Anything just off the top of your head? Just uh, indicators for when someone's actually trying to work on their problem. So I know if I'm working on the problem harder than they are, um, and the other one just uh, keeping empathy first instead of trying to jump into teaching. It's good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Nick. Yeah, I found uh, multiple times in the last three or four weeks the five E's mm -hmm. really stand out. Was, yeah, they're so simple, but they really help a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Caught myself several times going to be educated before I should be. Yeah, yeah, because that's what we, I got the answer. To. Why, why wouldn't I share that right away? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I think it's good how you express things we can control with things we can't control. Yeah. And the emphasis on that we can control ourselves with that little wheel, which I like that we're involved with. Yeah. But you know, I, I can't control my children, how they react with each other. I yeah. Can't. I can't control what people say and do and what they think of me and yeah. uh, in circumstances. And, and yet, um, just, I want to be more aware of uh, helping people to, to solve their own problem. Mm -hmm. the, the thing like, you can te teach them to fit, you can give them fish or you can teach them to fish. And, yeah. uh, it's just like, that's not always easy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at first, like, you may give something, somebody may be so weak that they need. But then, yes, but initially, then, you but may. Then, but. but then you go into helping them, and, and like they said, discerning whether they're, they're ready or not. There's a story that I read, and I couldn't remember the book, so I didn't put it in the suggested resources, but it's very much like that. I can't remember the name of the book. It's a community development book. But they, um, a church used to do this Christmas outreach, and they they have uh, um, the congregation come in and donate presents, and people in need would come and, and take you know uh, free presents and, and, and whatever. And what they found was um, that uh, there was people were kind of feeling shame when they came in. They felt like you know what you think you're better than us because you're giving us presents that we can't afford, you know, and that kind of thing. And so what they decided to do, let's do something different this year. Let's give them some dignity. And so what they did is they had them, they had them, the, the congregation do the same thing, donate the presents, but instead of having come, people come in and just give it to them, we're going to mark things at garage sale prices. And so now they're getting a deal instead of getting a handout. And for the people that couldn't afford even those prices, they said, you can, you can work a shift, and then you'll earn something to spend on these things here. And, and just thinking creatively on how to empower people instead of just handing out and trying to make them fix the problem. So, yeah. cool. Cool. Well, let's, uh, let's finish in prayer, because I know um, the kids are finishing here. So. Lord, I thank you for this class, and I thank you for everybody here. And I just speak, Lord, that, that um, you would just give them a download. Help them to be better helpers. Help them be healthier helpers. And, uh, Lord, I pray that they'd have vision to impact the world around them. 
and that they would, uh, they would do that in ways that they would be refreshed and recharged, that helping would be a joy and not a burden. I pray your blessing over them. I pray that you would um, give them vision um, in all that they're doing, that they wouldn't have to, to be motivated by pain, but they'd be motivated by vision. And I pray, God, that you would open their eyes to the things that they can control and release the burden of anything that they can in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.